imagine I had a number, and I rounded it to one decimal place, and I ended up with 4.3. But I didn't tell you what the original number was. What might it have been? To help us answer this question, we're going to draw a number line, and place 4.3 in the centre. On the left, we're going to put the number that's one decimal place, but below 4.3, so 4.2, and on the right, the one that's above it to one decimal place, 4.4. We're also going to put the numbers that are in between these, but to two decimal places. So the numbers in between 4.2 and 4.3 are these, and in between 4.3 and 4.4 are these. So which of these would have rounded to 4.3? Let's start on the left hand side. 4.21 would have rounded down to 4.2, so that one's no good. What about 4.22? That would have also rounded down to 4.2. And so would 4.23, 4.24, but when we get to 4.25, that one would round up to 4.3. And so would all of these numbers here. Then if we go past 4.3, 4.31 would round down to 4.3, so that one's okay. And so is 4.32, and 4.33, and 4.34. But once we hit 4.35, that one would round up to 4.4. So that one's not okay, and nor are the rest of the numbers. So all of these numbers would round down to 4.2, all of these would round up to 4.4, but these would round up to 4.3, and these would round down to 4.3. Let's have a closer look at this section of the number line. At the moment, it looks like the largest possible number would be 4.34. But what about if we zoomed in again and went a little bit past 4.34? So 4.341. That would still round down to 4.3, so that's okay. And what about 4.345 halfway in between that interval? that's okay as well. And so is 4.349. In fact, we could take any number we want as long as we go up to 4.35, but don't actually pick 4.35. The numbers at either end of this interval are important to answer this question. 4.25 is what we call the lower bound, and 4.35 is what we call the upper bound. We can write this down mathematically in the following way. We take a letter, for instance n, and we say that n is the set of numbers that round to 4.3, and they are in between 4.25 and 4.35. However, we need to take care to include 4.25, but not include 4.35. To do this, we put a less than or equal to symbol here. This means we're saying the number could be equal to 4.25. However, we leave a less than symbol with the 4.35 to indicate we can have any number up to that number, but not that number itself. This here is called an error interval, and this is the point of this video. Let's have a look at what an exam question might look like. A typical exam question would say we have a number n which has been rounded to one decimal place. The result is 6.7, and we need to write down the error interval for n. To do this, we can sketch a number line and place the number from the question in the middle. This one's to one decimal place, so we can do the number that's one decimal place but below 6.7, that's 6.6, .6, and one decimal place above that is 6.8. Then if we look at the midpoints of these, we find the upper and lower bounds. So the lower bound is this one here, that's 6.65, and the upper bound is this one here, 6.75. We can now write an error interval using those numbers. So we start with the letter that's given to us in the question, in this case it's n, and then we write our inequality symbols, making sure the left one is less than or equal to, but the right one is less than, and then we put the lower bound on the left, and the upper bound on the right. So this is the answer to this question. There are many different ways of asking error intervals questions, and I'm going to go through all of them now for you in this video. So let's try another one, but this time it's been rounded to two decimal places, and the result is 8.42, and we need to write down this error interval. The difference here is this one's been rounded to two decimal places, so when we do the number line, we place the number from the question in the middle, 8.42, but we need numbers that have two decimal places that are immediately below and above this, so 8.41 and 8.43. Then we find the bounds in the same way, so halfway in between these. This one will be 8.415, and this one will be 8.425. Then we can form the error interval. Notice this time it's a different letter, it's Y. So we put Y, then these inequality symbols, then the lower bound 8.415, and the upper bound 8.425. In this question we have a number but it's been rounded to significant figures this time instead of decimal places and the result is 17,000, and we need to write its error interval. So this time we need to remember its significant figures and not decimal places. Let's draw a number line and place the number from the question 17,000 in the middle. Then we need to place a number above and below this that has been rounded to two significant figures. 
So the one immediately below would be 16,000, and the one immediately above would be 18,000. We can then look in between these to find the bounds. So in between 16,000 and 17,000 is 16,500, and in between 17,000 and 18,000 is 17,500. We can now form the error interval, and we need to use the letter M this time. So M, then these inequality symbols, and the lower bound 16,500, and the upper bound 17,500. For this question, we've got a number that's been rounded to the nearest 50, and the result is 8,350, and we need to write the error interval for D. So this time the difference is it's been rounded to the nearest 50. So we draw a number line, place the number from the question in the middle, then we need a number that's immediately below this that could have been rounded to the nearest 50. To do this, we just take off 50, so 8,300. And then the one above, we just add 50, so 8,400. Then we find the numbers halfway in between these, so 8,325 and 8,375. So we take the letter from the question, this time it's D, draw the inequality symbols, and then place the lower bound and the upper bound to form the error interval. In this question, we have a number G that's been rounded to the nearest integer, and the result is 120, and we need to write the error interval for G. So for this one, it's the nearest integer, which means the nearest whole number. So we draw a number line and place 120 in the middle, but we go the whole number below and the whole number above, so 119 and 121. A really common mistake here is some people may go for 115 and 125. This would be the case if it said the nearest 10 rather than the nearest integer. Then we find the numbers halfway in between these, so 119.5 and 120.5, and then form the error interval using the letter G. So G, the inequality symbols, the lower bound, the upper bound. Sometimes the questions are given in context. For example, the capacity of a can of drink is 330 millilitres correct to the nearest milliliter, and we need to write the error interval for the capacity. So for this one we're going to do correct to the nearest milliliter. So if we draw the number line, put 330 in the middle, then we need to go the milliliter below and the milliliter above. This is another one where it's very common to make a mistake. Some people may go for 325 and 335, assuming it's the nearest 10 milliliters, but we're going to the nearest whole milliliter. So we go one milliliter below, 329, and one above, 331. Let's find the numbers in between these, so 329.5 and 330.5. This time we haven't been given a letter, but we do know it's the capacity. So we could say it's the capacity is in between 329.5 and 330.5. In this question, we have a number that's been truncated to one decimal place, and we've been told it's 3.7. Sometimes rather than rounding numbers, we truncate them. Truncating is different to rounding. I'm gonna show you how that works now. So imagine we had a different number, this one here, 9.2154. You already know how to round this number to a decimal place, but what if I said we truncated it to one decimal place? When you truncate a number to one decimal place, you can put a line after the first decimal place, so here, and then imagine you chop the number at this point, and all of the rest of the numbers here are going to fall off. So you'd end up with a number 9.2. If we took this number again, but truncated it to two decimal places, we draw the line after the second decimal place, and then chop here, and all of these numbers would now fall off so we'd end up with 9.21. So truncating is a bit like rounding, but it's also different, because the numbers never round up or down, you just chop off some of the remaining digits. So how does this affect our error interval? Well, if we truncated a number to one decimal place and we got 3.7, it means we chopped it here. This means we could actually put anything after this red line. It could be 372, just an 8, 1147, 999, or even just nothing. It wouldn't actually matter because anything that comes after this red line would disappear when we truncate it. So the lowest possible number is if we had nothing there, so 3.7, and we could have anything as long as we don't go up to 3.8. So for an error interval for this number, we would write B, the letter from the question, then the inequality signs as before, but this time it will be 3.7 all the way up to 3.8. Let's have a look at a second example of truncating, so this time to two decimal places, and the result is 9.41, and we need to write the error interval for C. So this time it's been truncated to two decimal places, so the number must be in between 9.41 and 9.42. Because people are much more familiar with rounding, they sometimes find truncating difficult at first. 
but once you practice these, truncating is actually probably easier. You just write down the number you're given in the question and the one that's one place above it. Sometimes there are worded questions where you need to be particularly careful about the answers you give. These are much more common in AQA papers. For example, this one here. The number of people entering a shop in one hour is 200 to one significant figure. We need to write down the minimum number of people entering the shop and also the maximum. We could start this by doing an error interval. So the number of people entering the shop must be somewhere in between 150 and 250. The question says what's the minimum possible number of people entering the shop? Well, this is 150. If it were any lower, it would have rounded to 100, not 200. But you need to be really careful with the maximum number of people. The maximum number of people is not the upper bound. The upper bound is 250, but if it were actually this many people, that would round up to 300. Since the maximum number of people must be a whole number, the maximum number of people would be 249. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you found it useful. Check out the one I think you should watch next and subscribe so you don't miss out on future videos. And remember, there are exam questions you can practice now in this video's description.